Hello and welcome to lecture number two. Today we'll talk about the system of separation of powers and checks and balances. As many of you are probably aware, we have three branches in the United States government. On the upper left, we see the legislative branch, which is made up of Congress. On the upper right, we see the executive branch, where the president lives and works in the White House. And in the bottom center, we have the judiciary, or the Supreme Court building. The way that I'd like to approach this topic is to fill out this chart. We'll answer questions such as who is included in the government, a quick job description of each, and five separate checks. The reason why this system was established? Well, it's pretty easy. It was to protect our freedom and liberty. That was the design. If one branch attacks our freedom and liberty, then the others can check or stop or block the actions of the others in order to protect us. I kind of already started with this, but we'll go ahead and review. The executive branch is made up of the president and all of the members of the president's administrative staff, like the members of his cabinet. The legislative branch is made up of the House and the Senate. Collectively, they're called Congress. And the judicial branch is made up of the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the land, and all of the federal courts, which are located in each state. A quick two-word description can identify the job of each branch. The executive branch has the job of enforcing laws. At times, people get confused as to the president's actual role, but here we see President Obama as well as President Bush. They're the ones who enforce laws that are passed by Congress. They do so by providing direction to organizations like the Drug Enforcement Agency or the um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Services. It's the job of the legislative branch to write laws. This photo identifies the United States Capitol. On the left, we see the chamber where the House of Representatives operates, and on the right is where the Senate is located. Our judiciary has the job of interpreting laws to let us know what they actually mean. This photo identifies the nine members of the United States Supreme Court today. In the center, we see the Chief Justice, John Roberts. Now, one way that the executive branch can check or influence the actions of the judiciary is that if there's a vacancy on one of the courts, the president has the sole power to nominate someone to fill one of those vacancies. Here we see some examples of recent nominees for both President Obama as well as President Trump. Each has named two members to the United States Supreme Court. While the president has the sole authority to nominate someone to fill a vacancy, the Senate has the ability to either confirm or reject any of those judicial nominations. This is one way that the legislative branch can check both the executive as well as judicial branches. The judiciary can also check the actions of both the legislative branch and executive. For example, the judiciary can declare presidential actions to be unconstitutional. I'd like to offer a couple of examples here. In the 1970s, during the Watergate scandal, it was learned that President Nixon had a taping system at the White House, yet he refused to give up those tapes. In a unanimous decision, the United States Supreme Court ordered the president to hand over or release those tapes. More recently, we see some examples with the Trump administration. When Donald Trump ran for president, he talked about having a Muslim ban on people entering the United States from predominantly Muslim countries. One of those bans was um, uh, put into place by the president and it was struck down by the courts. He revised it and um, issued another one and that was struck down by the Supreme Court. They modified it one final time uh, and eventually 
a modified version of that so-called Muslim travel ban was allowed to remain in place by our courts. Here is another set of checks. First, the president has the ability to propose legislation. When people run for the presidency, they often come up with slogans or they champion a set of ideas. In the upper left, we see Franklin Roosevelt, who promised the American people a new deal. In the bottom left, we see President Bush, who campaigned on the promise of a tax cut. In the upper right, we see President Obama talking about a national health care plan, and President Trump campaigned on the need for a border wall on the U.S. border with Mexico. While presidents can propose laws and ask Congress to pass legislation, they have no authority at all to pass laws. That's entirely within the purview of the legislative branch. Once a bill becomes a law, if someone files a lawsuit, the judiciary can also step in and declare laws to be unconstitutional. It's up to those nine members of the Supreme Court that have the final say to determine the interpretation of a law. Does it violate the Constitution? If so, that law can be struck down. Back in 1989, the Supreme Court struck down laws in several states and the federal government um, that uh, made it a felony to burn an American flag. Today, and since 1989, burning an American flag is a protected form of free speech. I'd like to address some additional checks now. If Congress passes legislation that the president doesn't support, the president has the authority to veto those bills. However, the legislative branch has the final say because the House and the Senate have the ability to override a presidential veto. I'd like to explain how that would work. Essentially, in order for a bill to become a law, it has to pass by a simple majority. However, if the president vetoes a bill, a two-thirds majority vote in the House and the Senate would override that presidential veto, and therefore a bill can become a law even without the president's approval or signature. When it comes to the military, the president is commander-in-chief of our armed forces. Here we see a couple of examples of the president acting as commander-in-chief. In the upper left, we see President Obama in the Situation Room approving the raid on Osama bin Laden. In the bottom right, we see President Trump addressing troops on an aircraft carrier. While the president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces, only Congress has the authority to declare war. Here we see Franklin Roosevelt in December of 1941 addressing Congress and asking them to declare war following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor the previous day. On the left, we see a copy of his speech. There have been conflicts between presidents and Congress in the past when it comes to actually waging war. The United States has only declared war five times in its history. Can you name them? It begins with the War of 1812, then the Mexican War in the 1840s, the Spanish-American War in the 1890s, and then World War I and World War II. The last time the United States declared war was in the 1940s. I'd like to point out one final check. If the president or a member of the judiciary commits a high crime or a misdemeanor or commits treason, the legislative branch has the authority to impeach and even remove them from office. If the president is the one who's been impeached, 
the Constitution tells us that the Chief Justice presides over any presidential impeachment trial. Now, I've noticed over the years that uh, a lot of people are confused by the word impeachment, so I'd like to talk about what this actually means, because impeachment does not mean removal from office. A two-step process is needed in order to remove the president or a member of the judiciary from office. The first of those steps is impeachment. This would allow for the bringing of official charges against someone. The House of Representatives has the sole power to impeach, and it requires a simple majority vote. An impeachment is similar to an indictment. Essentially, what this means is if someone is indicted for a crime, this means they're officially charged with that crime. The government is saying, we think you have committed a particular crime. If you or I were accused of a crime, we would have a trial. The same would be true if the president was impeached. There would be a trial. It would take place in the Senate. At the end of that trial, the Senate would act as a jury. A two-thirds majority vote is needed to remove the president or a member of the judiciary from office. The three presidents shown here have been impeached, Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and Donald Trump. However, there were never enough votes for any of them to be removed from office. Because Donald Trump was impeached most recently, let's look at a little more detail as to what happened with his trial. On the left, we see an image of Mitch McConnell, who was the leader of the Senate when President Trump had his impeachment trial. Senate rules do require that if a president has been impeached, then there must be a trial. Uh, it's kind of interesting, though, because uh, senators are required to remain silent throughout the entire trial. For example, they're not allowed to have their cell phones. The, during the mornings, the Senate would conduct its regular business, but then beginning at one o'clock, that's when the trial would begin. And if necessary, it would go six days a week. After he was impeached, President Trump had a trial in December of 2019. The result was largely along party lines. There were not enough votes to remove him from office. In fact, a majority voted not guilty. You can see on the first charge, which was obstruction of justice, 53 senators voted not guilty to 47. Um, on the second charge, there was one Republican senator who voted to remove President Trump from office. That was Mitt Romney. However, clearly there were not enough votes to remove him from office. Therefore, President Trump has been impeached, yet he was not removed from office, just like Clinton and Johnson in the past. Now that we've explored that system of separation of powers and checks and balances, I'd like to show how the Constitution is a living document through the amendment process. The Constitution is a living document because it can be changed and has been changed several times in its history. There's a two-step process that's been used most often. The first step is the proposal. A two-thirds majority vote is needed in both the House and the Senate. Once it's been approved, then it's sent to each of the states. It must be ratified by three quarters of the state legislatures to become part of the Constitution. I'd like to offer the Equal Rights Amendment as a so-called case study on how an amendment can go through this process. In the 1970s, it was proposed by a two-thirds vote in the House and the Senate. The exact language was, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Basically, it would prohibit discrimination based on sex. Initially, there was a great deal of support for the Equal Rights Amendment. 10 states ratified it, 20 states, 25, 30. But then opposition began to grow when many women, including Phyllis Schlafly, shown here, came out against it, uh, it kind of gave the ERA a death blow. While the Equal Rights Amendment was proposed by the House and the Senate, 
it was never ratified by enough states. So we do not have a provision in our Constitution calling for equal rights based on sex. There simply weren't enough votes. Maybe you'd like to address the issue of the Equal Rights Amendment uh, with some of your forum posts um, online. Uh, next, I'd like to just offer some concluding thoughts. Essentially, your goal for today would be an evaluation, a summary and evaluation of this idea of separation of powers and checks and balances. You'd want to identify many of those, the, all of those checks and then evaluate. Do you think this effectively protects our rights? Why or why not? Well, that's it for today. I hope you learned something new and take care and we'll see you online. Have a good day, everybody.